Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sharat Sina for agreeing to give this uh, very important talk. So far, we have not had in the series a talk uh, focused on systems side. Um, we had some talks about probability, pure mathematics, and so on. So this is a very important uh, talk, especially for those of you who are interested in pursuing research. So uh, I'd like to welcome and thank Dr. Sharad. Dr. Sharad is an associate professor of computer science and engineering. Uh, he's also the associate dean of faculty affairs at IIT Goa. So he did his PhD in computer science uh, and engineering from Nanyan Technological University, NTU, Singapore. And uh, he did his bachelor's from uh, CUSAT in 2007. Uh, he has uh, held visiting appointments at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and at the National University of Singapore, NUS. Uh, he is the recipient of the Best Paper Award at ICAD 2017 and a Best Paper Award nomination at CASES 2018. Uh, he's also been an editor-in-chief of IEEE Potentials, and he's a senior editor of ACM Ubiquity and an associate editor of IEEE Journal of Trans Translational Engineering in Health and Medicine. So uh, Dr. Sharad's research and teaching interests are in computer architecture, architectures for AI, computing systems design, reconfigurable computing, applications of computing uh, assistive technologies, medical devices, and computing system security. So I welcome Dr. Sharath, and um, please uh, start your talk. We are looking forward to hearing you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Neha, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you also to Ms. Maria and Professor Kamut for uh, uh, for in helping her invite me for this talk. This talk uh, is very different from any other talk that you normally see. Uh, normally the talks are centered around a research topic or some research uh, results, but this talk is more about introducing how research is done in the field of computing systems or how you can do research in computing systems field. So this is more suitable for students, for young researchers, postdocs, and early career faculty members, so that they can see the possibilities of research in the domain of computing systems. Now, this will be the outline of my talk. Uh, first of all, I felt it is important to help you understand what is a computing system. So we'll go through that. Then after that, I will discuss why it is interesting to do research in computing systems. And I will also show examples of few latest research results to drive home the point uh, about you know, research in computing systems to me. Then if you are a student, you are a postdoc, you are a PhD student, uh, you are an early career faculty, uh, what skills are needed to kick off your research in this area? So we'll go through that. After that, I will about uh, top systems conferences and top journals in systems areas and the you know how to get published at those places and finally i will conclude with some you know basic uh, guidelines just based on my experience about how you can build your research team and build your career in computing systems research now all the all the points that i will say in this talk they are my personal viewpoints if you talk to some other systems researchers, you will find them deviating or differing from my viewpoint here and there. So I just thought I, I'll put it in perspective that what I'm going to talk about is not cast in uh, stone. There could be differences if you talk to uh, other people who work in systems areas. So let us first try to understand what is a computing system. In, in simple terms, whenever we talk about computing system, we think of a combination of hardware and software. Okay? So for example, in computer architecture, if you are doing work, you are looking at the architecture of the processor, which is essentially hardware, as well as the instruction set architecture, which is the software side of processor. You cannot do anything on a processor without an ISA. 
there is also system on chip design where processor memory hardware accelerators they can all be put together in a single chip and then you make use of that chip to run certain applications fpgas some of you may be familiar with it uh, these are field programmable gate arrays these are chips that you can program with any kind of hardware design in fact you can also implement soft core processors on fpgas so you have both hardware and software computer vision systems these days you can see uh, uh, cctv cameras at many places if you look at the inside of a cctv camera you will see that there is both hardware and software and then embedded systems of course systems like what you find in your television or you find it in your smart refrigerator or you find it in your washing machine they're all uh, a mix of hardware and software but the scale can be different you can go from small scale systems like embedded systems to very large scale systems like large scale software systems so twitter facebook slack these are applications with which most of us are familiar and we see them as essentially software we are essentially interacting with the software part of the system uh, and this is a very large scale these are very large scale software systems of course at the back side or at the back end there is also very large scale hardware which is driving these large scale software systems but when we talk of these these uh, platforms like twitter facebook etc we essentially see them as large scale software implementations you also have scada systems which are used in a uh, uh, power distribution uh, and monitoring which are again large scale software systems to monitor how electricity is generated distributed recouped and and all of those things you can also have large scale hardware for example network processors network processors are processors that are deployed in computer networks so if so today you and i are interacting through this zoom application but at the end of the day all the packets are traveling through a network and those packets are getting routed to multiple places before they end up at your end so all of that routing is handled by network processors uh, and and companies like cisco build such network processors so these are large scale deployment of hardware you can also think of server processors or server class processors like what you find in amazon aws or, or microsoft azure which provide uh, a host of services and a host of facilities for people to make use of you have many core architecture kind of processors where inside one processor instead of having two cores four cores or eight cores you can have 100 cores you can have 500 cores in in the search even there are 1000 core processors and then we can think of the high performance computing facilities so a lot of the iits and research institutions and some top uh, you know private education institutions also have high performance facilities which are essentially large scale hardware both processor storage and network so i'll come to the storage now so those those kind of uh, facilities like hpc facilities they make use of large scale storage so network attached storage is one concept of uh, having large scale storage uh, to facilitate very high end or large scale computing you can have RAID kind of arrangement on your desktop as well as in the cloud to facilitate redundancy and uh, minimize the loss of data in case of any problem. So these, you know, these are the typical examples of uh, computing systems. We are not talking about uh, any particular algorithm here. We are not talking about any particular data structure here. We are not talking about any particular programming language here we are not talking about any particular operating system here we are talking about systems that make use of programming languages that rely on operating systems that rely on hardware that rely on networking that rely on storage so so the systems cut across various disciplines in uh, in computer science and engineering okay so you can think of them as cross layer uh, entities so any system is a cross-layer entity it, it cuts across various layers 
in which you can think of computer science and engineering as having been organized. Okay. So just I will expand that point a little bit more. From a CSE perspective, the computing systems span the following fields and subjects, which are typically taught in a CSE undergraduate program. So computer architecture is there, compilers is there, computer networks is taught, memory and storage uh, is taught at some places, at other places it's taught as a minor component, but it's still there. Operating systems is a mandatory course and embedded systems is also a popular course in a UG program. These six courses, uh, and of course the basic course in digital logic design or digital systems design, these six, seven courses form the backbone of computing systems uh, research. So if you want to do research in, uh, in computing systems, you should be comfortable with at least a few of these courses and their related knowledge bases. But in addition to those courses which are taught and which define the backbone of computing systems, area there are also courses which uh, you know which are touched upon by the computing systems uh, domain for example uh, programming languages i will show you later on how this is related computer arithmetic which is more about how computers how you can do mathematics with computers and algorithms and data structures which is uh, always uh, which are the two all two courses always taught in a CSE UG program these are also subjects or topics which once in a while or sometimes depending upon your research topic or research area you may have to get into okay a simple example i can give to you is if you are looking at say a sorting algorithm and you would have studied various kinds of sorting algorithms in your algorithms course but when you scale up the problem if you are asked to sort say 1 billion items okay or if you are asked to find out the highest frequency items which are purchased among say a series of say 10 million items then the scale of doing that sorting and searching is huge and and there hardware will come into picture you cannot simply write some c code and run it on your desktop or laptop and think of solving such problems it is not that they cannot be solved on your laptop and desktop. It is just that it will take a lot, a lot of time. And, and unless it is a fun exercise for you, there's no point in doing it on a laptop or desktop. In, in companies, uh, this would be done using uh, large scale hardware because it has some business implications. Okay. So you can see that in computing systems, uh, you have to be good at multiple things. You don't have to be an expert in all of them. Maybe you are an expert in one or two of them, but, but you have to be good and comfortable in a few other topics also. Now, let me give you a concrete example of a computing system. Examples are always better in understanding uh, concepts. So here is uh, the example of this application called Slack. Uh, some of you may have used Slack. Slack is a is an application that allows team-based communication, team-based work, you know, things like that. Now, Slack is organized as a client-server architecture. So there are things that are done on the client side, which is your desktop or your mobile phone. And then there are things that are done on the server side, which is the company which is giving you this uh, facility, okay, this application, Slack. Now, as a user of Slack, you can be signed in into multiple uh, teams inside Slack. So this is one study which was done by. Uh, so this is one study which was done by Slack uh, itself. Where it found that 36% of active Slack users are signed in to more than one team in the desktop app, which is your client app. 17% are signed into three or more teams and 5% are signed into five or more teams. 
So as a user, as a Slack user, it is basically saying that I am signed into more than one team at the same time. But I'm not using all the teams at the same time. I'm not interacting with all the teams at the same time. I'm not active on all the teams at the same time, which is the usual case. But in spite of that being the case, so a simple task of a simple task of deciding whether to send a notification or not goes through so many different steps. So all of this, a lot of this work was shifted to the server side. And as a result, the memory footprint was decreased from, you know, the maximum of a few 900 megabytes to about 150 megabytes. So this is an example of, of, uh, of investigation into a computing system. Because though you have your application running on both on the client side as well as on the server side, they both have their impacts on the memory that is available on respective client and server sides. And you want to optimize the utility of that memory by reducing the unnecessary memory utilization by the Slack application. So, uh, so this is how, you know, one example of how it can be done. Here we have another example of Shakti processors, which is uh, you know, a class of uh, RISC-V based processors where different processor classes have been designed by the Shakti team at IIT Madras, where E class is for smart card, C class is for operating in 0.5 to 1.5 gigahertz range, I class is in 1.5 to 2.5 gigahertz range. So these are all uh, examples of a computing system and, and you can see that they have been tailored depending on the target application domain. Okay. So next, uh, let me talk about why it is interesting to do research in computing systems. And the simplest answer is you can build something. Okay, you can build something, for example, you can build a processor, you can build a system on chip device, you can build a memory devices, so you can hold it in your hand. Whatever you are doing, you can hold it in your hand and see it as a tangible, as a tangible asset. Or you can help build something. So if you do research work in operating systems or networks, you will play a role in the realization of uh, you know, systems which are making use of uh, processors, memory devices, etc. So either you are building something or you are helping build something. So we can say that it is more hands-on in general, okay? Uh, but this is not to say that there are no abstractions involved. Of course, there are abstract concepts and abstractions involved in computing systems as well. But in general, it gives you the feeling that, you know, it's more hands-on. And obviously, if you can build something or help build something, you have the opportunity to turn ideas into action. You can do that with software also by writing various apps and games and those things. But at the end, they all have to run on some piece of hardware, okay? Uh, and the hardware has to be supported by various kinds of uh, you know, firmware like applications like OS, networking stacks, etc. So, so you have a greater opportunity to turn ideas into action. Now, let me give you some examples of latest result. Uh, this work comes from my own research group here, where we are working at, on machine learning on edge devices. Typically, machine learning models would work or run on desktop, laptop, or servers, etc. But we are asking the question. In fact, there are many other people in the world ask <clears throat> this question. That can we run them on small devices like small microcontrollers or small FPGs? And then there are some ways of doing that, like and these are algorithmic methods, model compression, model pruning, weight sharing, etc. These are algorithmic methods to reduce the size of the model. But I am a systems person, so I'm looking at it from a systems perspective where we are targeting on-chip memory reduction requirement. Okay. The weight values, the intermediate uh, values that are generated during computation, all of these need some storage. And some of these would need on-chip storage to reduce the latency of computation. So we are looking at you know, how we can reduce the on-chip memory requirement. It has got nothing to do with the algorithmic aspects of, of machine learning. 
but it has got to do with more with the implementation aspects of machine learning model implementation on hardware so this is uh, this is just um, for for reference i'm showing what we have done as one single uh, flowchart this here is another example of uh, a very latest research result this is again machine learning on edge devices but this is a chip this chip is called loihi and what i'm showing you here is the diagram of loihi 2 uh, from intel it's a neuromorphic chip because this chip uh, works on the concept of spiking neural networks which is a little different from the normal neural networks that you study uh, essentially these networks are based on the modeling of human brain so we have neurons in our brain so these chips are modeling the activities of neurons so they have a neuromorphic core which works uh, based on spiking neural network representation of data then on this chip we also have the traditional microprocessor cores on this chip itself we have various synchronous protocols implemented so that the communication between the various neuromorphic cores and the microprocessor cores can be established and then there is an noc fabric noc is a network on chip so noc is the noc uh, concept came when the interconnect density started to increase on chips by having a network on chip just like you have computer networks just like you have internet connecting different computers this is a network on the chip itself connecting different processor cores microprocessor cores as well as neuromorphic cores and you can see just by looking at this simple uh, diagram here simple image that if you have to work on a chip like that you have to learn about neuromorphic computing which is from the algorithmic aspects you have to know about microprocessor cores their design implementation etc you have to learn about uh, network on chip how you can make all these components work together and talk to each other and then you may have to learn about different kinds of protocols that can be used for communication over the network so a single simple chip like this and simple uh, which looks so simple behind that chip there are so many different uh, concepts and disciplines that you have to put together to make it work so this is another very good example of a computing system okay, okay. so now uh, i have told you what is a computing system in my opinion i have shown you some examples and i have shown you some research results Let's try to understand that if you are somebody who is interested in, uh, you know, starting research in this area, how should you go about it? So the first skill that is needed is you should have, you should be very comfortable doing exhaustive reading. Okay. Exhaustive reading is very important. And when I say reading, I mean research papers published in conferences or journals, industry-wide papers, which are published by companies or industry consortium books. Then there are uh, user guide, user guides and manuals published by companies. You should read all of that. As a researcher, one should not be reading only the research papers because that gives you very narrow perspective, but deep perspective on a particular problem. But when you read industry-wide papers or industry user guides, user manuals, you can develop a more broader perspective and the same is with the books okay and it is very easy uh, that you don't easy to see that you may not understand everything in one go it happens with everyone it happens with me also but the point is that one does not need to worry too much one does one just needs to be patient because you have to do so much of reading and Things may be new, things may be unknown to you. Uh, we need to be patient. We should refer to the subject areas that I mentioned in the beginning. You know, those are the subject areas in which one should be doing some reading. Of course, one can identify in which of those subject areas you want to go deeper and in which of those areas you just want to 
have uh, an understanding which is sufficient enough for you to make use of it or to deal deeper when the need arises. Okay. So as I tell my students, I tell them that you should have a bag of te technical skills cutting across the subject areas, not just, uh, you know, a couple of technical skills in one particular narrowly defined area, but you should have a bag of technical skills. And then you should be able to find an interesting problem to work on. Now, the question is, how will one find an interesting problem? And what is an interesting, interesting problem? A problem is interesting if uh, it is interesting to you and it is interesting to other people also who are working in similar areas. A problem is not interesting if it is only interesting to you. Okay? Because when you go on later to publish your work and all, you will have difficulty in creating excitement among the reviewers and the readers. You may do research on a problem that is only of interest to you. But if you want to have an impact based on the research you are doing, you have to find problems which are interesting to other people as well. Okay, And this is tied to point one, where this exhaustive reading, if you do, if one does, one will be able to understand or develop an understanding of what people are passionate about, what they are thinking about, what kind of questions are coming in the minds of other people. Then some general technical skills that uh, are needed are related to some software development experience in C, C++ primarily and some hardware development in Verilog, PHDL, etc. One should be comfortable with design and simulation tools for software like Kyle and then for hardware, we, Kyle is for software, especially ARM processors, but you have others, other uh, softwares as well. Xilinx view orders for hardware design. And then you should also be comfortable with using some debugging tools like GProf, Valgrind, Intel Mutant Profiler, etc. So some software development, some hardware development, some simulation, some design and implementation, and some debugging. These five uh, skills, if, if one has, then one is, uh, I would say, in my opinion, is ready to do some research in systems. The rest of the skills can be acquired uh, depending on the need. Specific technical skills that one may need will obviously depend on the research problem you choose. So if you work on a verification related problem, you have to study about verification methods, tools, etc. If you're going to work on compilers, you should be familiar with compiler frameworks like LLVM. Uh, if you're going to look at programming languages in relation to hardware, then you must understand how architectural support is given for programming languages to function in a better way. And then the number systems, which is, you know, the computer arithmetic, if depending on what kind of problem you're working on. For example, if you're working on hardware implementations of cryptographic algorithms, then you have to understand, you know, the mathematics and the number representation as relevant to cryptographic algorithms. You may not understand the algorithm in totality, but at least from a hardware point of view, which elements of that algorithm have an impact on the size of the hardware, on the power consumption of the hardware, on the performance of the hardware, those elements you should be, one should be able to identify. Okay. Okay. So if, if you have, if one has those skills, in my opinion, one is ready to kick, kick start the research in those uh, in computing systems. Now, once one has started research in computing systems, what is the next step? The next step, logical step is to publish one's research. And one should always try to publish at top conferences and journals. So I'll just uh, share with you some information about some top systems conferences and top systems journals. This list is only indicative. These lists are only indicative and not substantive. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea of what kind of conferences there are. So for instance, there is this conference called the International Symposium on Computer Architecture, which is focused on research in computer architecture where you can do research on the processor side, you can do research on the ISA side, you can do research on the performance of your processor, so many other things are there. 
okay and these the the ones that i'm listing here they're very broad in scope they talk about hardware software security power consumption verification design of you know of of uh, the domains that they're targeting design automation conference is another premium uh, uh, premier conference which looks at a lot of various uh, areas uh, in design automation and design automation is essentially focusing on how do you design a computing system okay you can design a computing system for say for example video processing or for audio processing or for ai applications or for the server uh, applications and that whole process the various steps involved so the scope is both from the hardware point of view as well as the software point of view similarly there is a conference called design automation and test in europe which is also a very broad based uh, conference this one is particularly interesting here uh, embedded systems week is essentially a collection of three conferences and the name of the conferences itself are very interesting so here is a conference on compilers architectures and synthesis for embedded systems and you can see that the just by the name of this conference you can figure out that this conference targets embedded systems but then targets compilers architecture and the design and development of such systems there is another conference on hardware software co design and system synthesis which is also part of esp where uh, the design of applications are seen as a as a two pronged strategy where you make use of both hardware and software by splitting your applications requirements uh, in such a way that something goes in hardware something goes in software and then you synthesize that system and then there is a conference on embedded software which is of course on the software side so even the names uh, you know can tell you that what they are looking for when it comes to systems uh there are also very narrowly defined conferences for example conferences targeting specifically field programmable gate arrays so sfpga is a very prominent conference fpl and fpt target mostly uh, logic and technology FCCM here is a conference that looks at the design and development of custom computing machines okay and again it is not simply uh, say designing one particular block say that does very efficient addition or one particular block that does very efficient multiplication but the focus here is on machines okay something that is a combination of multiple uh, uh functional units some networking some storage like that okay but as you go deeper into hardware design if you're designing a uh, very efficient multiplier very efficient divider and all and you are targeting them for field programmable technology you can publishing fpl fpt also okay so if you are doing some arithmetic implementations on hardware you can hardware being fpg in this case then fpl fpt are the conferences to go okay. then there are other computing systems conferences which are very limited in scope for example we have this uh, as pilos which is architectural support for programming languages and operating systems okay so this conference targets uh, uh, the intersection of computer architecture programming languages and operating systems and there are there are concepts that one can propose to build better operating systems but then until you do that in in hardware you will not get any benefit okay because for example many processors uh come with inbuilt memory management units and your os is responsible for memory management so if you give hardware level support for memory management it is much more but so those kind of research work you know can be published at these conferences if you are doing research in security whether it is hardware security or software security or cross layer security usenic security symposium is a top conference 
if you're working on storage systems and how memory and storage technologies can interact or play a role in the performance and design of computing systems, then SysStore is a prominent conference. Of course, if you're looking at high performance computing and all the supercomputing conference and uh, you know, high PC are the conferences to look for. Arith here is a conference which is dedicated on computer arithmetic. It only deals with software or hardware implementations of various kinds of computer arithmetic operations. And then in security itself, if you are looking at hardware level security or hardware oriented security, then host is a prominent conference. So these conferences are very narrowly defined in terms of scope or limited in scope, but then here you will get the, the top quality works uh, related to their respective areas. Similarly, we have uh, top computing systems journals. I have listed here a few from IEEE and ACM. Uh, uh, these are generally the places where people publish. Of course, there are also uh, systems journals from Elsevier and uh, Springer. For example, Journal of Systems Architecture, they are also there. But I'm showing here only some from the IEEE and ACM uh, organizations. Now I have shown you here a few lists and I said that this list is not exhaustive. Now the question is, how do you find top conferences or journals in systems areas or for that matter in any area? If I don't give you the list or if somebody does not prepare a list like that, then what are your options? So the options are first to speak to one's colleagues. Okay, colleagues who work in similar areas or in related areas and get some information from them. The other option is we look at where people from other top institutions are publishing. Okay. So Google search is your best friend. You go and look for people at other IITs and NITs or MIT, Oxford, whichever is a top institution in your understanding or in general understanding, go and look at where the people from those places are publishing. Okay. And then the third option is use general citation reports. However, general citation reports requires a subscription. So it is not free. Whereas the first two points, you know, the first two methods are completely free. At the most, you need to give a cup of coffee or tea or some lunch or dinner with your colleagues and friends, and you will get some information. Okay. So these are the ways of, of finding uh, you know, information about top conferences and journals. Now, once you have started your research, you would like to publish your research. So you have to write your paper. Only then one can publish one's research. But then the question is uh, where to publish? How do you select uh, which journal or conference to publish? Of course, one can talk to one's colleagues and again, go back and see where people from other top institutions are publishing. But then here you have more options. You can look at the scope of conferences and journals and be very sure what is the scope? Because if you have done excellent work, but you have sent to a conference where it is considered out of scope, it will not be accepted. Okay. So the paper, the work done in the paper has to align with the scope of the conference. One must read uh, previously accepted papers to understand the quality of papers accepted in such a uh, conference or journal and the expectations of the editorial board. So if say I tell you, I tell somebody tomorrow to write a paper for TVLSI and then that person has never written a paper for TVLSI earlier, then how is that person supposed to get started? So the first thing to do is to read a paper that has been published in TVLSI and see the structure of the paper, the quality of the work, the, uh, the novelty of the solution and the exhaustiveness of the comparison of proposed work with prior work. These are the three points to be understood by looking at the paper. And this will give one an idea of what are the expectations. Okay. Okay. Now, since one is talking about publishing one's paper, and as I mentioned earlier, 
that you should work on a on an interesting problem okay so how do we find such a problem or area again one should look at the scope of conferences and journals they are very good reference points to understand the breadth of work that is being taken up by researchers in 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 a particular domain okay so the keywords that come out in the call for papers or the keywords that are mentioned in the you know in the journal scope one should read them that gives a lot of information about uh you know what all possibilities exist and then write your paper now once one has written a paper that paper needs to be accepted okay so here one needs to focus on quality of work and the comprehensiveness of work in systems journals and conferences uh it is not enough to very often it is not enough to just do some simulation okay or if you are writing your work and and claiming whatever you want to claim only based on simulation unless your work is focused on simulation in other cases you will have to uh, show implementation results and all okay so one has to look at the comprehensiveness of the method and the results okay of course these days the conferences accept two kinds of papers in general work in progress papers versus full papers wip papers uh, allow you to publish early work early result where your method may not have developed completely where one may not have uh, comprehensive results but it looks promising you know there's sufficient result there's sufficient motivation to show that the work that is being done is promising so that can go as a work in progress paper and then when the remaining uh, the remainder of the stuff is ready one can submit as a full paper now writing a paper is very important and very often it happens that we think of writing a paper as an end exercise which is once we have done everything then we think okay now let's start writing the paper that model works it's not that it doesn't work but there is a better model the better model is that one should always keep the paper in mind while doing one's research okay because and as your research progresses we start writing some sections of the paper because when we start putting things in writing we begin to see the gaps that are there in our own work and and by keeping the paper in mind we also keep a structure in mind of how the research should uh progress and what is needed to write a good paper so if we keep that we have to eventually write a paper and we keep the requirements of the paper in mind it's a good uh, guiding line for carrying out research and the thing to note here is that the paper is not written for oneself i don't write a paper for myself i write a paper for somebody else to read and understand my work and that is a very critical part very often what happens is students write papers they write everything that they have done but when i read it or when somebody else reads it they don't understand anything because if you are writing for yourself half the thing is in your head you already know those things so you will not write it in a way where you are expecting that the paper will be read by somebody who has who doesn't have the complete understanding of the work that is also a reason why why one should keep the paper in mind while doing one's research i will very quickly uh, show you the scope of cases as an example because i thought this is a a good way to so this is a uh, this is the cases conference and uh, i'm only showing you the call for wip papers of course there is a call for full length papers but the conferences are typically organized into tracks and you can see here that there is ai systems and applications of ai at edge and there is a whole bunch of keywords there there is embedded systems and iot cps oh, we are able to see only your uh, presentation actually we are not oh. able to see if you have opened in the yeah. browser let me share my uh, screen is it visible now yes yes okay so uh yes 
So you can see that in track two, we have embedded systems and IoT, CPS security, safety, reliability, energy efficiency, blah, blah, blah. Uh, compiler techniques, optimization for timing, validation, verification. Track three is focused on memory and storage, where we talk about persistent memory, DNA-based memory, novel memory technologies like DRAM, MRAM, et cetera, in-memory processing, Track four is on accelerators, emerging technologies and applications, and track five is on architectures, compiler system level design. So, so just by looking at these five tracks, one knows that, okay, uh, if I'm doing a work related to say, our compilers, architecture and embedded systems, I can work on any of these five tracks, unless I have identified you know, where my interests lie. And then in any of those tracks, I can look at, you know, what are the possibilities? And then I can read more about these keywords and phrases to get an idea of the kind of questions that people are asking. And one can also go and look at the previous year's papers to see, uh, you know, what were published. Okay. Is the slide now visible? Yes, yes. Uh, so, so that was the reason why I wanted to show you this scope because it helps in getting many reference points, which otherwise we are not able to find easily. Okay. Next is uh, publishing in, again related to publishing in systems conferences and journals, handling reviews. Okay. So, the first two points I have already discussed. Uh, the third point is which is important point, uh, especially in systems conferences, of course, in, in, this is applicable to any other conference or journal, but I'm talking with respect to systems conferences and journals that don't get upset with review comments. Sometimes the review comments could be nasty, uh, but forget about the emotional part of it and just look at the, the technical part of comments. So use them, those comments to improve your work. There's no point ever in you know finding one excuse or the other to curse the reviewers because it simply builds negativity and you're not able to focus on how to uh, make your paper better. I have, uh, I review uh, frequently papers for TVLSI, TCAD and ACM journals in my area. I have seen papers which had very negative reviews with major lengthy comments, comments running into three, four pages but still the reviewers thought that it can be given one more chance. So it went into major revision with a lot of comments and the authors came back with the revision in such a nice way that it got accepted. Otherwise it would have been rejected in the next round for sure. Okay. So there is no point in, in worrying that you got a six page review or a one page review, one page review. Very good. You have done an awesome job, but if it's a six page review or a four page review, nothing, Nothing to take it uh, too serious emotionally, just take it professionally and then uh, answer the questions, okay? It often happens that uh, we think that the reviewers are reviewing our work, that's correct. But every reviewer gives how much time to review a paper, maybe half an hour or one hour at the most. So as authors, one should think of the reviewers and one should make their life easy. If you complicate the reviewer's life, if you make it difficult for him or her to understand your paper, then you will end up with a lot of comments, okay? In terms of writing, in terms of explanation, in terms of organization, everything on top of your technical uh, comments, okay? So that is why writing the paper, as always I say, is for other people, it's not for us. So if we keep in mind that it will be read and reviewed by other people and we have to make their life easy, or it will go through in general uh, in, in an okay manner. Okay, the last section that I wanted to talk about briefly, uh, I know we are running short of time, is uh, building your research team and career. So, how do we build a team? And when I started my career here, I also have the same. I also had the same problem. Okay, so first thing is to find interested and passionate students. Okay, and. This does not mean that your interest and your passion should always align with the interest and passion of students. That alignment may not always be there or the perfect alignment may not be there. We only have to look at, you know, 
whether there is an overlap or not whether you can get interested in their ideas or they can get interested in your ideas uh, and how much of overlap that there is that's the main thing and this is not a one time search exercise it's a continuous exercise it is like talent spotting you know there are people who are called as talent spotters if their only job is to spot talent if you are running a a sports team there are people who do talent spotting for you from all over the country or all over the state in the us the intelligence agencies do talent spotting to find out possible recruits similarly this is a talent spotting exercise and it's a continuous exercise okay and one should read exhaustively and also make the students read as much as as much if not more that's because uh, at the end of the day the the faculty member has to guide the students and unless you are on top of the concept the guidance may not be proper it does not mean that one has to know everything beforehand one can also read and learn and you know absorb knowledge as as we move ahead in a research project but that reading has to be there and uh, one should not hesitate to ask tough questions to oneself as well as to one students because unless we ask the tough questions we will not be able to hammer out the details and we will not uh you know be able to appreciate all the nuts and bolts that would go into making a research project successful and i can tell you that some of these top conferences conferences and and uh, journals uh sometimes the reviewers are so expert that they will pinpoint every minute detail uh today only i got the second round of review of one of my students paper it was submitted at usenix i showed earlier uh, usenix security symposium in second round also there is a whole lot of comments and when you read those comments you can understand that the person reading the comment he knows every i mean he knows in and out of what we are talking about okay now it has gone into a third division so uh so so there's no no there's nothing to worry about if you are being asked tough questions or you are asking tough questions it should be done because this is just a learning process it's not this it's not a question of uh, you know fighting or establishing uh, superiority okay. uh one should also think of collaborating with colleagues but one should do one's homework properly because collaboration requires commitment from both the sides and uh, some degree of acceptance you know of each other's commitments and other other commitments etc so it can be done uh it's just that it needs It, it happens organically. If you force it, uh, it's very difficult to make it work. And try to publish mostly in top conferences and journals because this will attract students. There's no other way students will come to one's research group if we are not publishing in top conferences and journals. Okay? Because they will always compare that this guy is publishing here and that guy is publishing there, that guy is publishing at better places. And these days, with the advent of internet and all. it is very easy to find that information so uh it's important to publish in in top conferences and journals and of course it helps one's career as well so uh as my parting thoughts uh, reading exhaustively and frequently is is something that needs to be done on a regular basis there's no escape from it it's a boring task but there's no escaping this this part of of life at least in research and one should look at publishing good papers but also as often as possible so both the frequency and the quality one needs to strategize you know publishing five three papers in three years or you know one paper in two years sometimes it's very good because maybe one has done you know an astounding work ground breaking work but otherwise uh the the quality and the quantity needs to be a uh, balanced this is not to say that one should publish you know not good papers one should always try to publish good papers that should be the goal and then working on the frequency of those publications one should volunteer to review papers for journals and conferences this is very useful because once once we start reviewing for journals and conferences people get to know about you point number 1 point number 2 you see how other people write papers before even they have been accepted in a journal or conference and not only that when the decision on those papers are sent to the authors 
you will get a copy of what comments other reviewers have given okay now this is a third person's paper sorry a second person's paper that you are reviewing and a third person is reviewing and you can see your reviews versus other person's reviews it's a very good learning exercise i have learned a lot by by reading the reviews the review comments given by other people while i am doing my own review of a given paper uh, research can have its ups and downs that's quite possible but one should try to be in control the important point which i think uh, as 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 far as control is concerned is that one should know when to begin when to pause and when to stop otherwise normally once we begin we think we are on a running spree and we just keep running but sometimes in research it is better to pause and reflect and sometimes it is better to simply stop and and look for something else i mean look for some other problem or some other way to solve it instead of instead of trying to beat the nail you know nail uh, nail into the wood as much as possible and finally wherever it is possible uh, one should look at commercializing research it's a difficult very difficult part to commercialize research but one should keep that in mind it may not happen immediately it may not happen in the next 5 years but maybe it will happen in the next 10 years because these thoughts will guide our research related actions okay. okay so that is all that i have to share today i have already overshot the timing uh i'll be happy to take questions yeah thank you doctor uh, sharad uh, now i uh, invite questions from the participants you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your questions Yeah, can I ask a question, Loyla? Uh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sharad. It was an excellent talk, and this is the first time uh, that we have a talk on systems area. And uh, uh, you know, it, it's really uh, nice to hear uh, you know the inside uh, stories uh, of a researcher working in the area of systems. Um, my question is uh, why. Uh, you know we we find it difficult to find uh, researchers working in the systems area here in india or is it just a local uh, phenomena or it's a global uh, concern uh, so one okay there are a couple of reasons for this but one reason that is prominent is uh, ultimately who becomes a researcher it is the students who go through an undergraduate and a postgraduate education and they then decide to go into a research career but there is also this fact that students are very impressionable so they go by the hype now whatever is in hype uh, they would want to latch on to that so for example uh, machine learning and deep learning today is the hype and everybody i mean we receive so many applications for phd admissions 90% of them want to work in machine learning and deep learning so they go by the hype and but once they realize that the hype is is only there as much once you get into the details of any particular field it is uh, it requires a lot of hard work so one is this hype mentality which i observe you know in our country uh that has an impact the second impact the second reason is that we have success stories in the country about uh research in systems areas for example this shakti processor itself or ajit processor which neha was a member of these are home grown success stories but then these success stories are not so much popular or popularized that it strikes the minds of these uh, young students so to them whatever is uh, fed by the common press or popular press or you know uh, whatever google facebook says uh, they go by it. and it is not that google facebook don't do any work on systems they do a lot of work on systems yes but then what you see in the press is more on the uh, more on the visual side of it which attracts people so it is so these are the two factors but also i think in our education system when we teach students we have to show them that there is one part which is easily visible and then there is another part which is not easily visible and we have to keep driving this point uh, as often as possible 
otherwise this change will not happen easily of course working in systems is also a little hard because as i showed earlier uh, to work on a systems related topic uh, you will have to cut across you know a few subject areas on the other hand if you are working on new algorithms or and you don't care about implementation at all then you can simply focus on algorithms right if you are only working on say uh, uh, programming languages without worrying about how the garbage collection will happen or how uh, what impact uh, how we lessen the impact on execution by making changes to the language then you can simply work on programming language without worrying about the implementation part of it so it's easier to work in that manner um, i mean of course those areas have their own challenging problems and difficulties but compared to systems uh, i think in systems one needs a little bit more uh, variety in skills and interest so apart from hipc none of these conferences are uh, being held in india right i mean uh, on the system side yeah i hear of these conferences have... hipc is the only one uh, which is happening uh, in india yeah hipc is the only one that is happening i think uh, this cases had happened once maybe long time back in india there are some other conferences related to uh, mobile computing mobile yeah. systems yeah mob, i think mob, a mobile. couple of them have happened in india but by and large these conferences do not happen here i see some like vlsi design i think is uh, yes vlsi design is there but that is by origin indian conference okay. yeah 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 thank you thank you for this any other so, participant would like to ask uh, questions so, so i have a question so if i can uh, so yes uh, go ahead thanks uh, for the wonderful talk in fact uh, i think the talk is very valuable to faculty members as well as uh, young phd students uh, so so uh, my talk was uh, i mean it is a observation that uh, like in a follow up to what professor uh, kamath asked why we do not have a lot of people uh, producing good research in the system side so maybe one thing is that we don't as yet have a culture of build it yourself make it yourself uh, thing uh, that way at least it iit is a little doing a little better than uh, some of the other places like where a lot of the education is focused on assignments and you build things incrementally and so on but i think still it's lacking and one problem is that let's say if you compare to us universities they already have the legacy so maybe the first os the first processor etc etc was built in us and if you are repeating that if you build it for the first time it's not going to compete with the state of the art so you have to accept that build something and then improve on that and so on so we are not ready to uh, i think uh, you know build something that is that does not compete right away with state of the art so what are your thoughts on how we can improve that in the regional colleges or in iit system yeah it is uh, it is very true that that do it yourself culture or this hands on culture is is quite lacking here uh we give a lot of assignments we give a lot of exams but then they are all you know pen and paper or whatever laptop desktop based but building something is uh, is is something that is lacking so you know there's a few ways in which one can take this up further is like if say in your curriculum you have a multidisciplinary design project okay for example when i was teaching in ntu there in cs curriculum there was a project there was a you know full semester course called mdp a multidisciplinary design project which involved uh, every year the problem would change so for instance uh, in one year one semester and this is a course along with other courses in one year the problem was that you have to design a self navigating robot you can use a, a raspberry pi based platform but then you have to integrate uh, location sensors you have to integrate color sensors you have to integrate uh, distance sensors various kinds of sensors and then you have to write code 
which would run on the processor to you know work with all these sensors you have to implement one of the routing algorithms that you learned in your algorithms course so something like the a star uh, algorithm and then your um, your robot has to communicate with an application that is there on an ipad from where you will control your robot and then your maze is designed and then the robot has to you know go through the maze and and localize itself and bring it bring itself to the correct spot three students would typically do such a project but then there's so much of learning that happens i mean simple tasks like uh, the controller that would the controller that you would implement on your raspberry pi which would control the speed of rotation of the wheels of your robot it i, I mean i saw projects where the robots would just uh, you know they would run so fast that within half a second they would just crash themselves or they would uh, you know they would start slipping on the surface so all of those things those details the students had to work out as part of their project so by bringing a a, a project where you have different components from you know different subject areas that is one way where the students can learn uh, you know and be interested in doing a hands on uh, thing of course the other part is cultural thing where i think by and large in india we have a culture of of consumption than that of a production and it is not just in cs but it's i think in almost every other aspect of life uh so to change that also i think one needs to advertise more the the shining examples that are there in the country the reason i put the shakti processor slide there was because i thought that is very relevant i could have chosen some other foreign uh, product but i thought this is it is good to show that something like that has happened in the country also uh so you know if 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 every engineering college other than the mdp project if they start doing some uh some project which they can claim as their own in terms of both hardware and software then even though if, if, even if it does not compete with the state of the art then that would be good but it cannot be a one off exercise it cannot be like i did today and then i tell people okay we have done this thing and then we forget about it for the next one year then that impact will not be there that drive will not be there so so one can do that but then one has to continuously push it further down the line i mean a simple example i can say is that if you look at raspberry pi the raspberry pi when it was designed i think at at cambridge uh after that raspberry pi foundation came and it has been in existence for the last 10 years or something like that and it has gone all over the world on the other hand there are boards i think uh, uh a couple of boards designed with some processor in, in india also but then you don't hear about them there's no uh, no push to drive them no push to to advertise them so you don't know about them and then there's no scaling up of that work so those uh, those uh, ecosystem related aspects also need to be uh, you know considered if this culture has to change say over the next you know 5 or 10 years see the, uh, we often require system integrators i mean uh, i see a lot of scope where you need to as you said uh, you need to have a knowledge of multiple areas what is the scope for this in the industry because i think on in the industry you might find uh, you know more systems people they may not be researchers okay but they may have learned a lot of these things uh, through experience through uh, their you know long experience they may have uh, uh, gained those skills right so these system integrators uh, are they in demand in the industry i mean if somebody has to uh, are they also in short supply not available uh, easily yeah yeah uh, in the indian uh, industry even when i was working in the industry uh, design engineers uh, verification engineers uh, 
people who could you know build things they are always in short supply and in demand i when i was working in the industry i was building uh, or implementing algorithms on fpgas doing the design verification everything and then that would go into a board and then the board would be integrated to put it all together so there are companies in the country which are doing that kind of work not many companies but then there are companies which are doing that kind of work and even they have a problem in finding the correct talent for projects like mdps and all the idea is that the students will develop a variety of skills and appreciation for system integration for putting things together and it is uh, you know those skills and that thought process that uh, as far as i understand industry uh, values there is a question from the student uh, yeah yes uh, yeah there is a question from this uh, student anish natekar will silicon fabrication in, in india be possible in the coming years at manufacturing level so if you are following the the, the recent semicon 2022 which was held in bangalore uh, the government of india has has announced this india semiconductor mission and under that a fab is going to be set up that announcement has already come through uh, where uh, chips would be manufactured in the country and of course if you are manufacturing chips then you will be doing manufacturing of silicon wafers also i believe when you wrote silicon fabrication you meant uh, the fabrication of chips right the manufacturing of chips but in either case if 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 the country is doing with the ism mission in place and with that fab that is announced that in place if we are doing a uh, chip design uh, manufacturing then we can of course do wafer manufacturing also by the way this is it's not that currently it is not being done in the country there is semiconductor complex in chandigarh scl which does it it is just that it does it at 180 nanometers what we are talking about today at the global level in in uh, semiconductor industry is like 7 nanometers and 5 nanometer technologies which is way advanced than 180 nanometer uh but currently i i am not very sure that under ism what is the target but with the fab in place we can definitely hope to see uh, manufacturing at a bit more advanced nodes than compared to 180 nanometer so yes in short your the answer to your question is yes any more questions ஒரு <laughs> I'm sure all the participants have learned a lot today and the knowledge that they have gained will definitely help them in pursuing their research and career in computing systems. Uh today we had a total of uh, 20 participants. Uh, thank you all for your presence, attention and participation. Uh thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye everyone.